Okay, today's date is 4 October 2023. I'm in Williamsburg, Virginia. I've got the pleasure of sitting down and speaking with Vic Brown. Thank you, sir, very much for uh, agreeing to sit down and talk to us. Uh, if you could just give us a little bit of background on who you are, where were you born, where'd you grow up, go to school, that kind of thing. Well, as they say in TV, thank you for having me. Uh, Our pleasure. I'm uh, honored and pleased to uh, have been one of the selectees for this program. And I think it's a program with uh, values we'll discover later in the future. Uh, uh, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant on the 15th of June, uh, 1958, after having spent four years as an ROTC, Air Force ROTC cadet. Um, and I was to serve in uniform for 30 years and 28 days. <clears throat> now, 11 of those years were active duty and 19 in the ready reserve. Um, I'm going to uh, mention that uh, I want to focus on uh, my experiences in Vietnam. I spent a year in uh, Vietnam <clears throat> and uh, it was a, a, a kind of a formative experience in one's life. I, I don't think any veteran of a combat uh, situation comes back without his or her head screwed on a little differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me several years to stop comparing every element of my life to what it was like when I was in Vietnam. Um, the uh, first thing that spikes to my memory, um, which by the way is, we're going back 57 years here. So uh, I was the senior Air Force security officer and uh, my responsibility was running a communication center that brought in 24-7, by the way, I had three officers and 25 enlisted uh, on my team. And we brought in all of the top secret code word special intelligence derived from the intercept of foreign government communications. That information uh, then we parsed out to those who had the clearances for it and those who were responsible for running the air war in uh, uh, Vietnam at that time. Uh, the uh, Air Force Special Security Office was located um, uh, across the green, if you will, um, from the headquarters 7th Air Force. And on the night of the uh, 5th, 6th of December, 1966, I was sitting at my desk drinking my fourth or fifth cup of coffee uh, at ODARP 30, as we called it, and uh, smoking my pipe. And all of a sudden, a bunch of detonations uh, uh, occurred, and we were quickly to find out that uh, the uh, Viet Cong hadn't learned that it wasn't uh, kosher to attack a headquarters. We thought it was uh, very ill-advised on their part to do that. Um, they were focusing, they had come through a um, old French drain that we didn't know existed, but it was, uh, they infiltrated carrying uh, mortars and uh, it was a suicide mission on their part um, because our security was reasonably good and they had dogs and the dogs alerted uh, the security team to uh, what was about to happen. And they started <coughs> running down the runways, throwing satchel charges at the aircraft in the revetments and, uh, you, and employing their mortars, uh, w one of which was uh, aimed at uh, the headquarters area. So uh, I uh, ran into the uh, uh, communication center uh, operations area and got on the horn, so to speak, um, 
to our counterparts at Benoit, which was, I think, about 25 miles north of us. And they had A1E uh, fighters on strip alert, meaning that they were armed, fueled, and the pilots were in a ready, ready shack. And I was uh, calling for air support. And uh, I was typing so fast that the keyboard would freeze up. And I pr was probably averaging one mistake per, per word uh, because it was a, a scary time. Uh, shrapnel jangling through the roof. Uh, and uh, I can remember in, in one case going from one area to another and I jumped into a sandbag revetment on top of a young lad and he said, uh, uh, keep your cool, Captain, or something like that. And I said, this is a hell of a way to make a living, don't you think? And uh, so it took uh, till about dawn to finish off the attack. Um, there were 20 or 30 uh, Viet Cong bodies collected, and uh, <coughs> we had uh, the loss of one dog. I don't know, I can't recall the statistics of uh, the losses that, that the security guys f faced, but uh, it was uh, very dynamic and, and uh, traumatic, if you will, situation. Um, we uh, didn't take any losses from my element, thank God, <coughs> and uh, it was, um, it brought us to a new awareness of the war and, and how we ought to be prepared for it. For some insane reason, I, well, the buildup of personnel was so fast, they sent some food and a lot of people, bunch of guns and ammo, uh, but they uh, didn't remember us. I, my armament was uh, two 12-gauge shotguns left over by the French. Uh, half a dozen uh, 38 revolvers and a bag full of thermite grenades which are used to put on top of a, a steel safe and it will burn its way all the way down and, and destroy everything in that safe. That's if you go into an emergency destruction um, profile. I elected not to have that done and that was, as it turned out, the right call. Um, but uh, we, we were blessed by having air support come in and, uh, and they took out uh, two of the mortar positions and uh, kind of turned the tide with the help of the U.S. Marine Corps who showed up with some, some of their guys. And I took a blood oath that night. I'd never tell another joke about Marines so long <laughs> as I lived. And I've honored that commitment uh, because uh, in a combat situation, you couldn't ask for anything better than having some Marines on one side of you and the other. Uh, so God bless the Marines uh, that night in particular. Um, there was another incident that uh, I look back with uh, some sardonic uh, feelings uh, I was, I'd had dinner that night at the officers club and I was walking back toward my operational area and all of a sudden my throat closed up and my eyes burned and tears rolling down my, and I realized I was under a gas attack and I started running. I said to myself, if I can run 11 steps, then it's not lethal gas. It's uh, harassing gas um, and so I, m my relief was profound when I got to my 11th running step and uh, it turns out that two Viet Cong had crawled, infiltrated the base with a mortar, crawled up into the base chapel steeple and started uh, using uh, a gas generator that they had uh, uh, found or taken over, stolen or wh however they came by it, 
and they were generating clouds of this tear gas rolling over the base, and, and it made everybody's job a hell of a lot harder uh, in that situation, because none of us had gas masks. That was World War I stuff. Well, and World War II. <clears throat> but um, that was, uh, we had to divert all the uh, incoming aircraft from missions to other bases, particularly to Da Nang. <clears throat> um, n another, uh, these incidents just occurred sitting at your desk one day in a bunch of detonations, it seems that one of Marshall Key's hotshot pilots decided to do a barrel roll over the runway at about, I don't know what, 200, 300 feet. And he didn't pull up in time and went right through a flak tower and then into a crowded Vietnamese uh, commercial area where uh, there were women and children and and uh, I can't remember what the death toll was, but it was a terrible uh, tragedy, a self-inflicted wound. Um, U.S. pilots would never do barrel rolls at two or 300 feet, uh, in this war anyway, flying uh, jets. Um, so uh, I got a, a front row seat in a, in a gunfight that resembled um, what you'd see in, in a movie. Um, it seems that, uh, I think it was Tudo Street, some uh, n uh, South Vietnamese Marines got drunk, they got into an argument over s some bar girl or another, and they fell out in the street and started shooting at each other with 45s. <laughs> and uh, I was in my, quarters at the time, I leaned over this balcony uh, iron fencing, and all of a sudden, a, uh, a round ricocheted off the fencing about maybe uh, 10 feet uh, away from me, and it hit, suddenly hit me that it was not a good idea to be leaning over watching this unfold. I was on the seventh floor mm. of a hotel at that time. Um, Little things like that got your attention, um, but not all of it was like that. We had some strange and fun uh, things that happened as well. Um, we, uh, I'd been in country about mm, 10 and a half months, got a phone call from a staff sergeant at the aerial port. He says, Captain Brown, I have a lieutenant for you. And I said, well, I doubt that. I only have a TO and E that calls for four officers, myself and three others. And I have those three billets filled. He says, I'm looking at the orders and they clearly send this lieutenant to you. I said, okay, tell him to bring me a copy of the orders, uh, get the Gray Navy bus, and get off at the main headquarters and ask somebody where the AFSO is. He says, this is not a him, it's a her. I said, Sergeant, I've been in this place for 10 and a half months. The only round eye I've seen were nurses who jumped off airplanes, loaded them up with wounded, jumped back on the plane and took off. Um, otherwise, no females. Well, he said, uh, on my mother's grave, I have an Air Force first lieutenant type female type. I said, oh, I said, Sergeant, I'm going to send my Jeep and a driver to pick up this lieutenant. If you don't provide one each round eye lieutenant, I'll have your stripes. Well, we sent off the vehicle, came back. This young officer could have stepped off the pages of Playboy or Penthouse. Uh, she was an absolute knockout, even in uniform. Uh, and uh, so normally I would uh, 
vector a new incoming person, the first thing you have to do is clear them for signals intelligence. Uh, and in a, in a pinch, you could probably do that in 20 minutes. Uh, but with this young lady, I took it on myself to make it a, a good two hour indoctrination. And uh, so I asked her if she'd care for some coffee and she said she would. The coffee we had in our coffee mess would make the blind see, the deaf hear, and the dead rise. It was that strong. And uh, we had a, a ground rule. Any man that came into the unit, no matter what his rank was, would first thing he had to do was clean the coffee pot. Any man leaving to rotate back to the States, the last thing he had to do was clean the coffee pots. So sometimes we'd have coffee pots cleaned three or four times in one week. Other times it would go three or four weeks between cleanings. So that's why the coffee was would keep you awake uh, during shift, what we call shifts. Um, we got, we lost two of our officers for a while and myself and one other officer were on duty 12 on and 12 off without any breaks. That, hap that went on for over a month and uh, I, that, that's a subject in itself. Anyway, I'm indoctrinating the lieutenant for signals intelligence and finally she says, uh, excuse me, Captain, but um, could you direct me to the female latrine? I said, sure. Uh, um, and I called in my so uh, senior sergeant, my NCOIC. I said, Sarge, you're on your second tour here. Where is the female latrine? I said, I've never seen it. And he said, Captain Brown, there is no female latrine on this base. I said, well, there's going to be right now. And so I said, round up one of the guys that can be spared, have him go up. And that, we had a latrine in the middle of the compound, and it was on stilts. You've seen pictures of buildings on, on these tall stilts because of flash flooding. So this one uh, airman went up to the door waited until the last guy vacated. And we're talking, you know, there were like four commodes on a side, so there was eight. Uh, and it was one of the most popular places on the base, let me tell you. <clears throat> um, so a long line of angry guys. They had never had to wait in line to go into the latrine. And, they, and there was a set of stairs up to a platform for ingress. Well, I said, the first order I'm going to give you, Lieutenant, is do not, uh, repeat, not read any of the graffiti written on the inside of this latrine. It is not for your consumption. Do you uh, read me? And she said, yes. So she went in, took care of her needs, and she came out on the, and standing on this uh, what do you call it, veranda or something. And there's this long line of guys, and one guy says, expletive deleted, it's a round eye. Somebody else says, expletive deleted, it's an officer. And another guy yells, present hops. Everybody goes like that, and they're saluting her. And she's the color of uh, red mahogany, <coughs> poor girl, and she, saluted back and said, as you were. And uh, so that was the introduction of the fir first female assigned to duty. I'm, I'm sorry, she was one of five, a lieutenant colonel, two majors, and two first lieutenants. As a result of the commander of what we used to call WAFs, Women Air Force, the commander of WAFs came and convinced the commanding general of 7th Air Force to bring in some female officers. And reluctantly, he disagreed. They turned, all of them turned out to be first class additions to our 
uh, war effort. Uh, the lieutenant, I, I left before the Tet Offensive, um, and she was pinned down under fire for several days, and they were, you know, no showers and uh, other kinds of difficulties. Uh, and she performed as well as any man in the unit under fire. We still had to bring our communications to bear. Um, so I think you said you had a question for me when we well, started. Uh, yes. Um, what, what made you join the, uh, the Air Force? Why did you decide? Well, there was a time when I pictured myself as a flyer. I was uh, in high school and it was, uh, it came to pass about some halfway through junior year that I had to pick a, a college. My parents were willing and able to f fund me uh, going to college. And I picked a school that was 500 miles away so that my parents couldn't easily dabble in my life on campus. And I picked a, a school that had Air Force ROTC. Um, Ohio Wesleyan seemed to have all of the uh, requirements of my young mind at that time. And um, I w applied and I was uh, accepted before any of my other applications at other schools came mm -hmm. through. So I closed the door on the selection process and said, I'm going to go to Ohio Wesleyan and I'm going to become a, a cadet. And I did that and uh, uh, never looked back. I'm, uh, I had a good, good run. Uh, takes a little explaining. After 11 years of active duty, uh, I was so thoroughly enjoying my experiences at Headquarters National Security Agency at Fort Meade that I switched horses. I uh, resigned my Air Force regular officer commission and became a civil service civilian at NSA and I re-upped, so to speak, in the Air Force as a ready reservist. And I was a, had a reserve commission. In those days, there were two kinds of commissions. That's gone now, but you had a regular commission or a reserve commission. And the, uh, the reserve commission folks, when the war is over, may or may not be asked to stay, <clears throat> but all the regular commissioned officers uh, automatically stayed in service if they wished. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, I had uh, one or two friends that uh, were like-minded with me, uh, and we joined the same fraternity, and we joined the same um, uh, ROTC detachment, uh, and we were all ultimately commissioned three years later. So I've, I've served a total of uh, plus or minus a few, a year or so. We, I served for 40 years in the signals intelligence business. Now, in the old days, <coughs> officers would be stovepiped in one discipline. After a while, that was no longer true. Uh, uh, an officer in the uh, intelligence game would uh, often spend some time with imagery, used to be called pho photography, mm -hmm. um, and he would spend some time with signals intelligence and, and some time with uh, uh, the spy game, and um, I think that was a mistake, and a lot of other people do too. We we grew somebody like me, starting as a 
second lieutenant ending, ending as a full colonel. Uh, and all of that was dedicated to signals intelligence so that I, I knew that game fairly well. Uh, whereas other officers who spent a year or two years here and then flipped over to here, uh, he was a good generalist, but it was a time when we needed officers that were particularists, if there is such a word. <coughs> um, that's a 5,000 word answer to your question, I think. Right. Uh, you, you said know, you wanted to be a pilot, or was that yeah, originally what you planned to do? I originally was interested in uh, becoming a pilot. And then they jacked up the uh, required service time. Okay. It, it, ROTC graduate who went into any other field, we call them ground pounders, uh, like I was, had a three-year commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you were went into flying, it was five and sometimes more, uh, depending on certain variables. <coughs> uh, and at that time, I didn't see myself, at that time, I was a, a cadet, and I didn't see myself wanting to spend five whole years in the Air Force. Um, so I opted out of the Air Force Specialty Code for flying. I got, I, I lucked out and got one for intelligence. <coughs> and then I got to having so much fun and it was so interesting that I decided to stay on in the Air Force. And uh, so instead of backing off because of a five-year commitment, uh, I took on a 30-year-plus <laughs> commitment. Uh, and the Air Force was very good to me. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, they've been uh, paying me ever since I retired. <laughs> What, what is signal intelligence? What does that entail? What that entails is, is a, a worldwide effort on, uh, spearheaded by the National Security Agency, which is the largest intelligence agency, much larger than CIA or DIA. Uh, and their job is to intercept foreign government communications to um, transcribe them from after we break the, these, the codes and ciphers, then we have to translate them into English, and then we have to write product reports on what, they, what the communication says, and then we can add our, from our fund of knowledge uh, background information. And then we have to write a product report and we have to distribute it to those people who have requested all information on a certain mm -hmm. discipline. When I was at NSA, right after I got back from, uh, from Vietnam, they put me in charge of a, an analytic unit charged with um, Chinese fighter <coughs> activities, production, uh, and <coughs> their flying and fighting capabilities, their location, uh, what, what they were working on technology-wise. And that was an interesting assignment. I was hoping to get into one of the Vietnamese elements, having just come from a year in Vietnam, but uh, they needed my kind of person in the Chinese arena at that time, so that's where I went. Um, and over the years I've had um, various assignments um, uh, that related to um, the kinds of disciplines like I just mentioned, the China, Chinese air. Uh, I had one uh, large division that was tracking uh, the Soviet 
transport problem. <clears throat> and you might say, well, boy, that isn't very sexy, until they load their airborne forces onto these transports and start going somewhere. That is a key indicator. Um, SAC headquarters wants to know that by yesterday uh, because we ramp up our readiness if we think that the Soviets are about to do something stupid mm -hmm. like invade Czechoslovakia. <coughs> um, and, and so I'm sure that uh, even though I've been out of the business for, for uh, more years than I was in it now, <coughs> Uh, I could guarantee you right now that National Security Agency and its, its uh, subordinate forces in the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, they're boresighted on the things that would indicate a tell or a, a information to key recipients. Um, as to what the enemy is likely doing, what they probably will do in the future, and for background information, what they have done in the past. Um, we have advanced considerably technologically. We used to uh, fly airplanes like the U-2 and the SR-71 over so the Soviet Union to collect the kind of intelligence I've just been addressing. Um, now, uh, almost all of that is obtained through satellites, of course. And um, the uh, exception might be uh, some country that uh, would send a hot air balloon to float over <laughs> the United States and collect intelligence. I was uh, really taken with that event and um, I think it must be that, uh, that a balloon is a, is a hard object for your surveillance to detect. There must have been other reasons they would do it as well, but um, deniability probably. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it's been a, a, a great... Uh, run. I, I'm uh, proud of the opportunities I've had to uh, serve in uniform and I, I'm pleased that there are folks like you guys that want to hear the stories and, and maybe file them away yeah. so that someday some archivist, some historian, some uh, writer uh, needing material can uh, Right. can call upon uh, a database that was uh, derived years earlier. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Did you, did you have any other family members that were military that maybe inspired you to join? or? No, uh, I didn't. Um, I was an only child and my uh, father, um, who sadly died very young, 52, but he had spent 30 plus years with the Department of Agriculture. And it, long after the World War II was over, he told me that he had been uh, cleared for uh, top secret and he was on a team of men that were working on uh, what ultimately became Agent Orange. But it was during World War II and um, he, my father had a half of a doctorate degree in, in geology. He ran out of money during the Depression, couldn't finish his PhD. <clears throat> but uh, a group of scientists had made really good progress. And then the uh, two atomic bombs were dropped and Japan surrendered just about the time we were getting ready to deploy this uh, Material that would, that the goal was to make all of Japan's arable lands unable to produce food. We were, we were one of the th 
uh, possibilities for World War II winning that war would be to s starve them into submission. Right. But uh, <coughs> uh, it was a uh, uh, a good effort, and uh, and they made good progress. And a couple of wars later, uh, they dug out all the, the old information and uh, added to it, and then it became Agent Orange. Uh, but uh, he was very proud of me for having opted to uh, to be a government man, not exactly like he was, but. Uh, uh, he he would visit, and I would, when I was at Shaw Air Force Base in Sumter, South Carolina, I, I took him down the flight line and showed mm -hmm. him the RF-4s, and uh, if you've got time for one more war story, I've got I one got that I think is... Uh, I do. Okay, well, <clears throat> so the the strategy during the Cuban Missile Crisis Aircraft from uh, FR, reconnaissance RF-4s loaded with film, they would take off, they would fly over Cuba taking these pictures, and their marching orders, these pilots, you fly in high, hot, and hard, you, you run your target, and then you come home, and there are no options. If you miss your target, We'll take care of that with another mission the yeah. next day. Do not ever, ever, ever rerun your target, okay? So this one pilot was flew his mission over Cuba, and he knew he had missed his target. And he, he didn't want to miss his target, so he violated the standing orders. Okay, so he, he goes over Cuba, and now signals intelligence, right? My game. Guys are listening to, the ground controller is screaming to the MiG-17 on the tail of this RF-4 saying, shoot the son of a bitch down, you know? And the pilot is up there saying, request permission to fire, request permission to fire. They were on two different channels. Instead of being on one channel where they could mm. hear each other, Neither, and this, this uh, RF-4 was dead meat if, they, if the communications had, well here I am collecting all these communications. I go to the commanding general of uh, 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 Ninth Air Force in the middle of the night and uh, <coughs> he get, jumps in the uniform, gets in his Jeep and goes to the flight line. And when this RF-4 lands, and the pilot is getting off the aircraft. The, the uh, general, Major General says, congratulations, Major. You've flown your last mission for the United States Air Force. You're grounded. You're the new officer's club office, uh, officer. Well, when that word got out, uh, you could better believe that nobody else re-ran the target. And, th and all these people didn't know how close to death that one pilot was. <coughs> Um, so, it is not an exaggeration to say that signals intelligence um, has saved a lot of lives, both military and civilian. Uh, uh, and at times that the general public has never heard about and probably never will. Uh, <coughs> there are things that happen that I didn't know about, too, until a lot later, if ever. Um, there was a, uh, a superstructure called Need to Know. So I might have all the top secret clearances uh, in, in a certain domain, mm -hmm. but I might not have the need to know what's going on with regard to Taiwan. So uh, that's obviously a way to protect yourself if you have an in-house defector. That guy can't pull the whole house of cards down. 
he can damage us, and we've had terribly damaging defections. Um, and I'm, uh, we in the intelligence community grieve when we find out that some s stupid airman gathers up a whole bunch of intelligence and, uh, and releases it uh, to uh, who, whoever he thinks ought to know about it. He's setting himself up over the uh, National Command Authority and uh, in deciding what to release and what not to release. Yeah. So, Can you tell us about the medals that you're wearing? They're my top three, so to speak. There's probably another 10 or 12. Those are um, chicken medals, I call them. <laughs> um, one is for marksmanship, one is for an overseas tour, one is for an unaccompanied overseas tour. Uh, the National, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the names of some. The uh, uh, I'm pulling a blank. At three o'clock in the morning, I'm going to call you and tell you <laughs> what. Uh, national this defense is ribbon. The, the the national defense yep. is one of the chicken ones. Uh, I say that <laughs> I I I don't want to disparage any of the ribbons and all, but um, the the one in the middle is the bronze star. There are two kinds of bronze stars, one with a V for valor. Mm. That's earned in combat. The, the one I'm wearing was not earned in combat. It was, I was in a combat environment, but I wasn't a combatant. Right. And so they thought I did a good enough job that when I left Vietnam, they awarded me the bronze star. M Meritorious Service Medal was awarded uh, the second time I was uh, uh, appointed to be the, um, I don't know what, what's the right words, uh, <coughs> we had a large cadre of ready reservists that came to NSA to train each year, and I had a hand in uh, that process to get these guys in the right place for the right kind of training. And uh, so uh, I guess they thought I did a good enough job to uh, 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 appoint me as the uh, most valuable reserve officer uh, for, for a period of two or three mm -hmm. years. Um, the third Medal, which is the highest, when you read you read them from uh, uh, left to right, and that was a medal uh, that captured. S some of us call it the Tombstone Medal. Uh, it it designates what the Air Force thought your worth was over the course of your career. So this represents slightly over 30 years uh, of a activity on my part, leading to the Air Force decision to uh, award me the, uh, that's embarrassing. Um, my mind just went blank. Um, anyway, uh, I, ch I chose the top three and, and I didn't wear all the rest. Uh, for this occasion, yeah, right. but we have uh, uh, quite a few, as, as you would expect, for for uh, men in our age group, most of us served in the military, yeah. and so we have a, uh, a very uh, ornate and uh, impressive program that we put on. Uh, I have the privilege of having invented that. Uh, activity starting in 2012. And each year we have uh, a band and we have um, uh, a 
primary speaker and um, uh, we have uh, sort of, I, I call them floor drills. Uh, we have a cadre f of Colonial Williamsburg performers in uniform. So we have uniforms from various years. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, and uh, it's considered one of the primary um, activities available to us in the course of a year uh, here. And uh, it's kind of fun to get the guys together. And of course, we can't get them together without the war story starting to yeah. come out. Yeah. Um, had a, I had a course for uh, Lieutenant Colonel and Colonels, uh, two week course. And this was in California. And uh, one of the guys stood up, an Army Colonel, and he said that uh, I'm inviting every Vietnam veteran, and these were all reservists, um, to come to the Officers Club after this class is over. And I'm buying the first round. And I thought to myself, man, you better have a thousand bucks in your pocket. <laughs> well, oddly enough, there was only about a baker's dozen of us that were Vietnam. We, we must have had 200 officers in the, in the class, but only about, uh, as I say, baker's dozen that mm -hmm. were um, veterans of Vietnam. <clears throat> well, we sat down at a, a round table and we started telling our stories. And it went around and around and around. And then another round of beer and around and around, <laughs> another round of beer. And uh, one of the really fun stories that the colonel who was buying the first round, he was a, a lieutenant at that time and he was marching a platoon through a rice paddy, paddy and ran into a NVN, a North Vietnamese uh, ambush. And they had machine guns and all the guys jumped into the uh, uh, di rice ditches. You know what mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. talking about? Uh, if you got into this ditch, then the machine guns would go just over top of you and not, not injure you. Well, the, this particular, at the time, lieutenant, later on, an army colonel, he uh, loved cigars, and he got his wife to send him a box of cigars. And he took an ammo pouch and filled it with cigars instead of ammo. <laughs> and he hooked it on the back of his uh, rucksack or web belt. <clears throat> and he jumped into a, start to say binjo ditch, he jumped into a, uh, one of these ditches. And the machine guns were sweeping back and forth, and all his guys were down there. And the machine gun went by and blew up his cigars. I mean, just, <laughs> he said, this is a big brown cloud of, of little bitty bits all floating down. He said, I got so mad, I leaped up with my uh, M16 and charged the machine gun nest and shot all of the <laughs> NVN guy, uh, uh, combatants. And uh, when I jumped up and ran forward, all my guys got up and did the same thing, and that they overwhelmed the North Vietnamese, all because of cigars. I right. thought that was a cool story. <clears throat> Never forgot it. But w we went, we went around and around, and finally the club officer came and said, "Colonel, I'm sorry. We we've tried to close you guys down for the past hour. You're over an hour uh, past the." closure of the officers club. If I have to, I'm going to have to call the base security <laughs> and have you guys escorted out. Well, we, we stumbled out finally, but it was, uh, it was a, a fun, fun in a, a, a fun is a fungible word. Yeah. It can mean different things. <laughs> and all of it, interestingly enough, all of it was humorous. Every story we told had humor or at least neutral. You didn't get stories about how uh, 
you lost a buddy or, or a whole bunch of buddies. Uh, that was off limits. <clears throat> and uh, I remember as a young lieutenant uh, sitting in an officer's club and listening to a gaggle of U.S. Uh, pilots and they uh, were telling their war stories about flying combat in World War II and uh, that that was sort of the same the same kind of phenomenon I think happens with every war. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what, what would you like others to know about your service? Well, that it's important it, that you that they know that that it was voluntary. Uh, although, because the draft ended halfway through my ROTC service as a cadet. And when I got on campus, about 95% of all uh, males were in ROTC because that protected them from being drafted. Right. <coughs> and uh, as soon as the, the war stopped and the draft stopped, about 50% of these guys uh, quit the ROTC. So the first thing I would want people to know is that I volunteered. The second, <clears throat> I think, was that I did serve for a year in a combat zone uh, and got shot at a, t a few times. <clears throat> um, I think uh, the third item might be loyalty. Um, I was uh, deeply loyal and committed to the mission, and uh, uh, I guess finally uh, the uh, sense of awe that I often had at the performance of our people under great duress. Uh, is that? This is a test of the National Wireless Emergency Alert System. There are two minutes of to maintain and improve alert and warning capabilities well. at the federal, state, local, tribal, and We'll just wait to, to be done. And Well, we can crawl out of our revetments now. <laughs> right. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, I think, as an institution, our military today may come damn close to ranking number one because so much of the rest of operations of a civilian nature seem to be broken. Yeah. Um, so, and if you if you're only going to have one institution standing strong, it better be the military because yeah. I think if if the military disintegrates, uh, we'll be speaking Chinese next generation. Yeah. Let me ask you one last question. I want you to call upon your your wisdom that you gained over all your your years in the military. What, what advice would you give to a young person that might see this interview in 50 years or 100 years? Or I would say that service to your nation is vital because not everybody believes that. And in World War II, on the 8th of December, there were mile-long lines of men waiting to enlist in the military. We need that kind of thinking, that kind of commitment to preserve our freedoms. Uh, our mission is sustained freedom. We've accomplished that mission throughout my lifetime and, and since the 1770s. Uh, I think you owe it. Now, does that mean you owe you? I'm telling you, you ought to be in the military. Well, not exactly, but there are other ways to serve. 
and uh, no finer way than in the military. And uh, I think that's a, a commitment that needs to be honored by more of our people. Agreed. We only have 1% or 2% of the total population in the military right now. And that's been true for a long time. <clears throat> that's, that's not healthy. We used to have a lot of veterans that were congressmen, senators, and members of the House. Uh, I don't know, there's, there's probably two or three left. Too bad. Yep. Well, sir, on behalf of the Americans in wartime experience, I want to thank you for taking some time out of your day to share some war stories. And uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to your country. Well, I want to thank you for the project that you're working on. And uh, I appreciate your kind uh, words. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Okay, thank you. <laughs>